All right, so start the recording a little late here, but just going over where we've been uh, so far in, uh, in, in from the last time we have been wrapping up this analysis of ways in which markets can fail due to reasons that are related to the environment and sustainability, mentioned that they can fail due to positive externalities as in public goods like pollution abatement. They can also fail um, due to negative externalities. And um, negative externalities are generally going to cause an overuse um, of a good or overproduction. And there is a pollution side to this as well. And so we can actually view um, you know, goods that generate pollution are an example of that. And so um, pollution abatement itself is a good that because it is a public good uh, tends to have an undersupply. But we also have on the, the flip side of that, there's another reason why we have a drive to, um, to see pollution in our air is that we have a drive to produce other goods that as a side effect produce pollution, which are a negative externality. And so not only do we have an undersupply of things that reduce or that increase, improve air quality, we have an oversupply of things that degrade air quality due to these incomplete market effects. And so these two things are related, but these are two reasons why it can be so difficult to get, say, clean air. Um, and, um, and you also, uh, due to negative externalities, uh, if we're talking about these open access goods, which we'll model uh, more explicitly today, then we'll see that there are um, other interesting effects that can happen with negative externalities, like a degraded benefit of an open access good due to too many people using it. So that's kind of what we'll, um, we'll put a pin in today. And so um, this, we also introduced, uh, and this is sort of a, you know, I wanna make sure that you're comfortable with this, this grouping here uh, but this axis of types of goods, maybe I'll try to make this cleaner, where on one, so these are, um, these in generally are, are, are goods. So you can have different types of goods or resources. And in these, uh, on one axis here, we, we talked about this as kind of the, this non-rivalry axis, which another way to say non-rivalry is um, that there's uh, the risk of competitive effects go this way. So, um, so rivalry is kind of a risk of competitive effects. And so as you move farther on this axis, then that means you get closer and closer towards non-rivalry, which means that one person can use the good without um, affecting the other person's use of a good. And so another way to view that is, um, is on closer to this side of the axis is you're using something that as you use it, it will prevent someone else from using it. So you're going to compete for those goods. And then the other axis is the non-excludability axis, which goes in this direction. But we also can reconceptualize that as an ownership axis going in the opposite direction. Uh, or um, you could view it as a property rights, uh, property rights axis going in the other direction. And so here we're saying that things that are down here on this axis are things that um, it's clear that a small number of people own or that the person who is consuming it is as sole access to it. They own it. They have rights to it. Um, whereas non-excludability going up in this direction uh, really just means that it is something that is not owned by anyone. So anyone can come in and use it. And so uh, with these two axes, things can blur the line and to what um, 
to how much, to what extent they have each one of these. But if you go to kind of the extremes, we get four types of goods. And those are the uh, private goods, which are down here. And these are, uh, I think, the normal goods that you think about. Um, so um, maybe I'll draw a little diagram, I'll patch these four areas here. And so private goods are like things that you, you, you own, your car, uh, your pencil, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, but they can also be things that we think about natural resources. We can have things like oil on private land. And so you can monopolize the oil on your own land. So we view it as a private resource or a private good. Likewise, you can have a private timber farm. Um, and you can have a private fishery. And we generally are going to find that we don't worry about private goods because uh, you don't usually worry about people over exploiting things that they own uh, because they have a coupled interest in the future. And so people tend not to over exploit something that will prevent them from being able to exploit it in the future. And so these tend to be complete markets, markets that have private goods involved in them. And then the um, other side, if we go to the right hand side of that line, we have club goods. And these are basically um, private goods for a larger group of owners. And so in this case, we can have things like toll roads and um, you know, club owned fisheries. So you can have groups that come together and say, uh, we are together going to police this area as our private fishery. Uh, we're going to allow a subset of us to use this fishery. And so all of us will benefit from this fishery. So if you know, our boats are on the fishery, we, we can use it. Um, you know, once we're in the fishery, we can use it however we want. But in order to become part of this group, we had to pay into that group. So it's, you know, it's a club. Um, or if you, um, if you own a home or something like that, you might live in an area where you've got a homeowners association. And so you can have HOA managed resources like HOA managed green spaces. And so in those cases, anybody who pays into the HOA can make use of the green space. Um, and generally, so long as clubs are small enough, we also don't usually worry that much about club goods. We actually view this idea of forming clubs as a solution to some of the problems with the other two goods, which are on the top half of this graph. And so again, it's almost like property rights and ownership. There's this magic bullet that solves so many sustainability problems uh, because you end up um, having an ability to control who has access to a resource. And because people's interests are coupled, the people using the resource are actually in, have an interest in making sure the resource continues to be there for them to continue to use it. And so again, these club goods, we don't worry too much about them. And if possible, if we can convert something from a public good or an open access good down towards something like a club good or a private good, then generally that means that um, a lot of the problems that we see are going to take care of themselves. And that's, um, you know, as we'll see that a little bit more clearly as we move on in the Latinx parts of the chapters. Um, so then uh, the ones that are really the problematic ones that we've been focusing on are these open access goods or open access resources, uh, sometimes, which include in them uh, so-called common pool resources. And common pool resources or CPRs, um, a lot of times uh, common pool resources, it kind of, so it, these are resources that are owned by a large group of people. If that large group of people is sufficiently small, then they kind of move down towards the club good um, area of things. And so if this, it kind of, when we talk about common pool resources, the reason we like to use the term open access is open access, it's not ambiguous. It's just like anybody's got access to it, but there's a lot of common pool resources that if the commons that is using it gets large enough, 
then the real then we we move into the problems we have with any open access resource and so that's part of the reason that i like to use the term open access and not common pool resources but um, they're very often thought to be synonymous, um, but in some contexts, a common pool resource is kind of only as a small group of people, in which case it may not have all the same problems as we associate with open access goods. So it really has to do with how many people have free access to that. And those are things like uh, deep ocean fisheries, um, a, uh, open access, so you can have um, you know, open access timber. So if you drive through uh, you know, the, the, the national parks around here, you see signs up that says like land of many uses. And it just basically means that people can go into them and they can, you know, they, can, they are, have sort of free reign over the land. And so um, they don't even have to pay to get onto the land. And so that is an example of if you just have this resource that anybody can use, then you might have these open access problems. And then aquifers. And so aquifers are kind of interesting um, because these underground aquifers look like uh, oil, for example. So you have to drill for oil and you might have to drill for water. Um, but in oil, you generally can monopolize that, whereas these aquifers are large enough that they're going to spread across a huge number of people and it's going to be hard to monopolize an aquifer. And so that, uh, because they're, so that's kind of what what makes it move across this line so it stops being a private good and becomes this open access good is that now there's a lot of people who can just access it as long as they can find the right spot where they can drill down and find this water. And then on the other side of that are the uh, public goods. And our examples of those uh, were like uh, the military, is um, one example, um, you know, I've, I've mentioned public radio, um, also clean air, pollution abatement, et cetera. And so these are things that are not depletable, but um, uh, so anybody can have access to them. Uh, in theory, anybody can contribute to them, but people probably aren't going to contribute to them because anybody's got free reign to benefit from them without uh, taking the benefit away from anyone else. So that's our kind of taxonomy of goods. And, um, and excludability tends to be, I, I mean, so both of these, these effects, rivalry and excludability matter, but excludability is really the kicker. It's like, it's like a comorbidity problem. It's like uh, how the problem manifests itself will depend on this rivalry dimension. But the real sustainability problems generally come from non-excludability. And so um, we've mentioned that if you're non-excludable and highly non-rival, then you're in this box where our main focus is going to be the public goods and the so-called free riders. Whereas in the, um, if you're highly rival and you're non-excludable, then the big axis problem is not the positive externalities that we saw over here, but the negative externalities of uh, of combined access, that my access reduces your ability to access. And that's what we're gonna start focusing on today is better modeling what's going on right here in these open access goods. So are there any questions um, about this non-rivalry and non-excludability and this general taxonomy? Does, um, does anyone sort of feel like they, they don't quite get what we mean by these things? And I can also just, if, if people do wanna put any questions into the the ether. I'll put that in the chat. Okay. All right. So this uh, region up here, these open access goods, is where we find the so-called tragedy of the commons, which I'm sure um, you are very familiar with, or at least have heard about in other classes. So in the tragedy of the commons, This is a classic form of what we'll find to be a so-called collective action problem, and we'll define that here in a second. And this is in that open access space. So we've got this open access resource. 
Um, and, uh, and then it is um, non-excludable, but rival. And the rivalry um, plays out in it being, um, I'll say, subtractable. And so what I mean by that is if somebody is using it, they are going to take away the benefit that someone else is going to have. And so I've mentioned a couple of these deep ocean fisheries, uh, rush hour traffic um, is one that I didn't mention. So another example is rush hour traffic. And I'll mention that here because I'll probably, my mind will probably end up going there. And a lot of my examples will be kind of about rush hour traffic uh, or um, you know, public Wi-Fi with limited bandwidth. All right, and so um, if we think, well, well, how do we model what happens in these problems? What would we expect things exactly economically? What's going on with these non-excludable resources? So what we're going to do is we're going to back off for just a second and imagine if these were private resources. Imagine if I had sole access to um, you know, uh, 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 an area where for timber. So I have sole access to a timber farm, for example. Uh, or uh, sole access to oil, for example, or sole access to a fishery. Um, I see a question in the chat. Could you argue that clean air is open access because the more people who pollute, the dirtier um, it is? So clean air as a, again, so we normally model clean air as a good. So we think of it as the more clean air, the better. And so we think about like using more of clean air uh, or contributing more to clean air creates a public good, and that's why we kind of put it in that public good space. But you can also, I guess, view the air as, a, um, as an open access resource, if anyone's open to pollute to it. And so under that interpretation, anybody can pollute and potentially gets all the benefits of pollution. Um, but then you'd say, well, then what makes it rival? And you could say that maybe as it gets more polluted, then people feel less inclined to pollute to it or they're more worried about regulation or something like that. And so there's probably a way that we could cast um, air as a type of open access resource because it is you know, freely available. And it, but but what, what gets sticky is then trying to understand um, the real open access problem is this, is, this, is this rivalry issue. And so that's why if we really try, start to think like what's the right model that captures the problem and helps us suggest potential solutions to the problem, then rather than modeling air as, as something where pollution is entering and it's harder and harder for more pollution to enter, it's better to kind of think of air as, well, clean air is something that we want more and more of, but we're going to get less of it. Or that air is being polluted because it's a side effect of being producing something else. And so that's why I, I would be hesitant. I, there's probably a way to do that, but it, it'll probably be a little bit artificial because I don't think it really has the same rivalry that creates those same sort of issues. Okay, so, um, so with, if we think about a private resource, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna plot, put a plot up here that we haven't seen for quite a while. And this is back before, when I was trying to motivate to you that marginal benefits and marginal costs matter, then I plotted out to you the total benefits and total costs. And so let's go back to thinking about that, the total benefits and total costs of a resource. So I'll draw this down to here maybe. And um, I don't know, maybe I want to give myself a little bit more um, room. Yeah, I'm going to try to, I'm just going to erase this so I can draw it a little smaller so I can draw something under it in a second here. So um, I'll draw this guy here. I think that will be good enough. And I'll say I have a quantity of some of this good. And then here, I normally do draw the marginal axis here, the dollars per quantity, but I'm gonna actually draw the raw dollars, the raw benefit. And so if this was a private good, so imagine um, if this, uh, you know, just saying, you know, if private resource, 
so that's our hypothetical scenario, then um, I imagine that I have a total benefit that's going to be kind of hump shaped for this type of resource. And so um, it's going to end maybe over here. So I have a benefit of zero here and a benefit of zero here. Um, so somewhere in between, maybe I get max benefit, which I'll draw up here. And I'm then just going to draw like a little parabola. So uh, it'll go up. It'll kiss this point down here and then come back down here. And, and so this here represents the, again, this is the total benefit. And so the idea here is that I, uh, as I use more and more of the good, I get some benefit out. But eventually, once I um, deplete some of that good, then the benefit starts uh, decreasing. And so um, let's say this might be easier to think about uh, what if I had a private highway for some reason, I can only put cars, you know, let's imagine Amazon just bought the 10, you know, so Amazon buys the 10, nobody else can use the 10 anymore. And then Amazon has to decide how many trucks to put on the 10 to do its shipping. And so um, Amazon decides that, you know, one truck is better than none because they didn't get some shipments, two trucks is better than one, and it goes on and on and on. But eventually, um, they get to the point where they put a thousand trucks on the 10 continuously and the thousand first truck creates congestion to the point where it slows down all the other thousand trucks. And the thousand and second truck creates more of that to the point where once you've got 2000 trucks, then actually all the trucks get packed onto the 10 and the 10 doesn't move anywhere. They just get stuck and they don't, it's like zero movement. And so, um, so that's why we might, you know, for these types of resources, that's why it might look like this. Or in a fishery, you can imagine that you could make decisions about how much you're fishing from your private fishery. And if you decide to put a whole lot of effort into fishing, you can manage to get every fish out of that fishery. But if you clear out the entire fishery, then the next year there won't be any fish there. So if you average your benefits out over the lifetime of your fishery or the lifetime of your company, then you're the net benefit or the average benefit of your fishery goes to zero. So you can view this as the average benefit, the number of fish per year of a fishery, where this would be the effort you're putting in to harvesting that fishery. That's another way to view it. So um, I would then plot the cost of that effort. And I can do that as just a diagonal line that um, goes, I'll just say it goes up like this. It's an incremental cost. So this is a constant marginal cost, which just means that with every unit of effort I put into it, my cost goes up by the same amount. And so what this tells me is that if it's a private resource, then the best thing for me to do is I want to maximize my, my private benefit. And to maximize my private benefit, then, um, and I should say that this is, um, this is the total cost with a constant marginal benefit. So, but the point here is it's total cost. So if I want to maximize my total benefit, then I'm maximizing the difference between benefit and cost. I'm maximizing this distance right here. So this is again going back to um, the uh, original you know, motivation for why we care about marginals is I drew these lines and I said we're interested in the net benefit here. And if you see as I draw these kind of lines here, then these lines get, um, they get bigger and bigger until they reach a, a peak and then they start getting smaller. And the point where they're the largest tends to be the point that is not the where you get the maximum uh, total benefits. It's somewhere over here. And it turns out that that is going to be the point where the tangent line at that point will be parallel to the total cost curve. And so that's just saying that the marginal benefits are going to equal the marginal costs. So if I were to uh, take a copy of this line, and so I'll just paste this line and then move it around. At least I thought I would. Give me a second. Sorry about that. All right. So if I paste this line, if I were to move it up here, then I can find that there is a point where this line that is parallel here intersects with my total cost curve. And it is around here. 
And so that there is the point where I have the efficient exploitation. And it's less than the maximum. So that is how much effort that I should put into it. If I put any more effort into extracting fish from the fishery or putting another car on I-10, if I own I-10, then the benefit that I will get out from that next fish will be less than the cost that I put in to getting that next fish. And that's why I get this max net benefit um, right here in between here. So this is the max net benefit. So then the question then becomes, all right, well then what happens when we make this open access? So in the open access case, there's a different cost that we think about here. It's really the cost of entry. So, um, so for an open access resource, then the real question is, um, what is the net benefit of entry? And then also, um, it, or basically what I'm asking here is what is the benefit of entry and what is the cost of entry? All right, so what do people think about this last one, cost? So what do you think for an open access resource, what is the cost of entry to the resource if it's open access? In the chat or audio, what do you think? If it's an open access resource, how costly is it going to be for me just to decide to use the resource? What cost do I face to enter and start using the resource? Is it zero? That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, it's, it's zero. As I basically, for an open access cost, the, um, the cost of entry uh, on the, is zero. That's the whole point of being open access. We don't charge you to enter it. You can come in, you can use it. It's open access. It's free. Just come right in right there. You're done. And so um, because the cost is equal to zero, then if you, if you like to think of it, you can also think that the, um, that the, the marginal cost um, of, of entry. And so this is the cost of entry. You can view that as also being equal to zero if it helps here. And then you can say, well, what is the benefit of entry? Well, the benefit of entry is just going to, it's going to depend on how many people are already using the resource. So if we think about, remember that Q is, uh, and I'm, I'm eating in the space that I'm going to draw something here in a second. And so I'm going to try to undo that. So if we remember that Q, this is how many, this is how much effort is already being used by others or me already in the resource. And so the benefit of entry is going to be whatever the, the total benefit is at level of Q minus um, whatever the, uh, the cost is uh, for continued exploitation. And so the, the, the net, what we're kind of, what I'm saying here is like in a fishery, I can decide which fishery to go to. And it's, if I have a bunch of fisheries that are free for me to enter, then my question becomes, um, given how many people are currently exploiting these different fisheries, then if I put my boat in this fishery, then what benefit am I going to get out of that boat? It might be three fish per year, or it might be three million fish per year. Um, and then what cost am I going to put into that? Um, and the cost is also going to depend on how many other people are currently putting effort into it, because if a lot of people are in the fishery looking for fish, they've depleted so many fish, it will be very difficult for me to find the fish. And so the cost 
um, is going to depend upon how many people are currently using it. And so really what I decide is, you know, deciding to enter a fishery, I look at both the, the benefits and the costs of, of getting fish at the current level of people using that. And so the real benefit of entry is, um, is this kind of net benefit here. So this here is the benefit of entry given that uh, Q effort already in use. And so um, if, you, if you think about it, um, this here, when I compare that to a cost, um, you know, so this is going to have a certain marginal benefit. So there will be some marginal benefit, which is kind of like, you know, how much does this change if, the, as I, if, I, if I put one effort into the fishery? So if I just decide to make that entry, the, the marginal benefit of entry is going to be positive, but the marginal cost of entry is going to be uh, zero. So um, as long, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is as long as, you know, right over here, for the open access case, as long as the benefit is greater than the cost, then the, <clears throat> you can think of it as the, the marginal benefit of entry will always be greater than zero. So the marginal benefit of just entry of the resource will be greater than zero, while the marginal cost of entry will be equal to zero. That's one way to kind of view it. And so long as we get a marginal benefit um, that is greater than a marginal cost, then we decide we're going to enter the resource. And so they're going to be, there's going to be entry from people up until the point at which the marginal benefit of entry is zero. And that is only going to occur. So this stops when the benefit at the current level of entry. So I'm going to say that stops when the benefit, I'll say QOA is equal to the cost. So this level, QOA, which is the level of exploitation of the resource at the open access equilibrium, occurs not when the marginal benefit of using the resource is equal to marginal cost of using the resource. It occurs when the marginal benefit of entry to the resource is equal to zero, which occurs when the benefit of using the resource is equal to the cost of using the resource, which is way the heck over here. And so that right there is the QOA. That is the open access equilibrium right there. And so that's when I say it stops right there. So the efficient level, so the socially efficient level that maximizes the actual net benefit um, to people using the fishery would have been back here. But because more people can enter the fishery who didn't have access before, then they're going to come in because using the fishery is better than not using the fishery. And so because there is that, that tiny little difference between not using the fishery and using the fishery, then they come in and they immediately feel a little bit of benefit. They don't realize they're putting a negative externality on everyone else who's already in the fishery. So those who are in the fishery, their benefit starts creeping down the benefits curve as you get depletion effects. But those entering the fishery are just seeing <clears throat> benefit that they didn't see when they were outside the fishery. And so you get entry to the open access resource up until the point when the net benefits go to zero. So at that point, you have a whole bunch of people in a resource and they're getting nothing useful out of it. The amount of effort they're putting into getting stuff out of the resource ends up being totally balanced by the benefit they're getting out of it. So you, um, the, it, it ends up becoming a useless resource. To put that in kind of different terms, um, if I were to draw the marginal benefit curves that we're kind of more used to seeing at this point, 
So if I were to maybe draw this down here, um, and I'll draw Q this way here. If this here is Q again, but now this is dollars per Q, then, uh, then what we're saying here is that the marginal benefit of this parabola, so I'm going back to the private case. So the marginal benefit of the parabola is going to be this um, straight line. And so hopefully I get this right. It's a, so it's gonna hit zero where this hits the max. And so I'm just gonna draw a line that crosses this point I draw that straight. And so the point where it crosses zero happens to be the point up here where you've got the maximum marginal benefit. And the marginal cost to a private exploiter is going to be um, a straight line that's equal to like the, you know, the, the fuel cost per boat in the case of a fishery. And so that is going to be a point which is going to intersect at the efficient equilibrium. So that right there, that is our <clears throat> equivalent to our um, Q star. But in the open access case, then we still get individuals entering and entering and entering causing them to overexploit this resource. And so that ends up um, bringing us to this level of exploitation, QOA, which if I were to extend down, would hit this <clears throat> marginal benefit curve down here where the marginal benefit is actually negative. And I kind of, um, it, so we know that if I were operating at the efficient equilibrium, this would be the surplus that I feel. So that's actually the net benefit is that area right there. But because I am operating at the open access, then there's this additional triangle, which is taking away from that surplus. And so this is the deadweight loss here in this region. And I didn't quite, because I didn't draw this as a perfect parabola and, you know, but if I would have gotten this exactly right, then what we would have seen here is that the deadweight loss here would be exactly identical to the benefit, the social equilibrium. So what this is showing here is if we let open access goods go to their equilibrium, then what we end up having is there's so much deadweight loss that we actually eliminate all of social benefits from the resource. So this is the major danger behind um, open access resources is that they make a lot of sense, but, uh, but they tend to be overexploited to the point where you actually end up getting zero net benefit out of them. And that example of that is like <clears throat> at, uh, at rush hour, rush hour traffic. Rush hour traffic is usually so slow that it is as it is no better than side streets and it could even be worse. So that's kind of the, the tragedy here of the commons is this idea that everyone is doing their individual best. So individually, we can't criticize someone for entering the resource because it was better for them to enter the resource than to stay out of the resource. So individually, they're doing what's best for them. But when everyone individually does what's best, then collectively, then it's no better than without the resource. So we have this fishery, we say everybody can fish in it, everybody does fish in it. Um, very quickly, there's no fish in the fishery. We may as well not have the fishery. We get a little blip in benefit, like from the people who got on the highway. There was a little blip of the people who got on the highway very at the beginning of rush hour and they got home a little bit quicker, but everyone else is now on the highway because they were promised that the highway would be better than the side streets. 
and end up getting home at the same time they would if they would have just taken side streets. So that's the tragedy, is that you're doing what's best for you, and you end up not actually doing any better than you would if you would have made the, made the other choice, because everyone else is doing what's best for them. So everyone's choice to do something that benefits them puts a cost on everyone else. And so that ends up being effectively another example of a negative externality. So that's how we view open access resources from this supply and demand perspective. And now I want to switch to a different perspective, totally different than the supply and demand, which sometimes makes it easier to see these problems um, when there are these problems that are more discrete, like do I enter or do I not? So we'll get to that in just a second, but are there any questions about this basic diagram here where the open access resource generates deadweight loss because individuals are paying attention to their entry decisions and not their utilization decisions. Okay. And that's also why we bin open access resources into the category of incomplete markets. So you say, well, how do we solve uh, open access resources? Well, that's why you have this handy dandy graph here is that you say, um, well, the major problem here is excludability. So what can I do to increase excludability? And so in the case of highways, uh, well, maybe I make them toll roads. If now you, you create a cost of entry, then that marginal cost will be such that, so here the big problem was that the marginal cost to entry was equal to zero because the marginal benefit of entry is just the net benefit of whatever use you're going to get out of the resource if you finally get in there. So if you increase the marginal cost of entry so that it's non-zero, then you end up having people uh, stopping using the resource before the resource is totally depleted. So if you set the price of the resource high enough, then you can end up conserving the resource. And that's why we have toll roads, is that we are preventing them from being open access uh, resources that will be overexploited. Of course, there's other reasons why you can, we will, towards the end of, uh, of the semester, we'll talk more about the difference between taxes that are distortionary and taxes that actually have a benefit. Um, so, you know, if you raise taxes to the point where you, you force everyone to efficiently use an open access resource, that's a good level of taxes. Any more level of taxes, now you've distorted the social equilibrium and you're actually doing more damage. So there's kind of a right level of taxes, just like there's a right amount of the toll. Likewise, club-owned fisheries. How do you deal with an open access fishery? Well, you introduce property rights. So and those property rights end up helping people to internalize the cost that they are imposing on everyone else. I pay a cost because I know that when I enter the fishery, the fish that I take up are fish that other people in the fishery can't take up. And so my cost is compensating them for the benefit that they used to get without me there. When there were two fishermen in the fishery, then in that case, they could catch fish more quickly. But when then there's three, then those two now can't catch fish as quickly. And so my cost to into the fishery is effectively compensating them, or in the Calder Hicks sense, it potentially compensates them for the loss of benefit that they get by me entering the fishery. So that's the way we deal with open access. All right, any other questions about that? Okay, so I hope you see that in this um, maybe makes sense when we talk through it, but this is not the most comfortable way for us to do this analysis for these open access problems when it's a discrete choice of does someone use the resource or not use the resource. And so in that case, economists, um, although economists love these supply and demand curves, 
Um, uh, in certain types of problems like these collective action problems, they actually favor a different type of analytical framework. And that's a framework that comes from game theory. So this is like a brief introduction to where uh, to, to game theory when applied to sustainability problems. And so uh, we are focusing on collective action problems. And those collective action problems are ones in which it is the individual is better off cooperating or coordinating with others. Um, uh, but does not do to conflicting interests. So in other words, in the highway case, if you and I both leave work at the same time, we could agree that I get to take the highway and you get to take the side streets. And that might end up being better off because that way I get all the benefits of the highway because you're not you know, mucking things up. But then why is it fair for you to take the side streets and me to take the highway? So how do we break that, uh, that problem between us? So how do we agree who's going to do what? And how do you then enforce that agreement? Because we have no way to enforce that, then everybody ends up doing the kind of uh, just what's best for them, even though uh, when you get enough people doing what's best for them, it ends up being what's worst for the group as a whole. So that's what a collective action problem is, is how do we, um, how do we manage collective action? How do we um, allocate goods to people in ways that seem totally arbitrary? Who, does, who gets the highway and who gets the side streets? And so um, in, because these problems are largely problems that are discrete choices. And so that might be cooperate or not cooperate, which sometimes people refer to as defect. Or that might mean um, enter or not enter in the case of resources. Then um, we, it's, it's often more convenient to use a framework um, from game theory. So this is well handled by so-called game theory, which defines players that um, have moves that we're going to call strategies, that have a set of strategies. And in game theory, we say, given the number of players we have and the number of strategies we have and the payoffs that are determined by the uh, collective um, choices of strategies. So we say, we have these many players, they can all play these strategies and if they play this strategy against this strategy, then these are the payoffs that go to the different players. If we know all of that information, then we can put it in a nice, tidy, concise um, analytical unit, similar to our supply and demand curves, then we can predict what are the likely outcomes. And then we can sort of start better understanding what we need to do to maybe start moving things toward an outcome that is more sustainably favorable. And so, uh, the, the common example that you hear of is the so-called prisoner's dilemma, and which I'll demonstrate here with um, a payoff matrix. And so in game theory, we have these things called payoff matrices. And so in a payoff matrix, we've got, uh, so I'm going to draw a little box with four uh, boxes within it. So I'll do that. Um, this here. And I'm going to divide it as such. 
And so up top here, um, well, I'll just do on the left, I'm going to write uh, the player one. So I'm going to say that I've got this player one choices. And in the case of the so-called prisoner's dilemma, then that player one can choose to cooperate with the other player or defect. And then player two, um, and maybe I'm just going to write this all in one color just to make it quicker, but then player two also can decide to cooperate or defect. And so the scenario you're supposed to be thinking about is a you have two prisoners that have both been arrested at the site of a crime. Uh, police don't know that police don't have enough evidence to say that either one of these individuals was involved in the crime, but they're pretty darn sure that they, they were. So they separate the two prisoners so they can't uh, work with each other. And they try to get the prisoners to rat out the other prisoner, because if they can get um, one of them giving evidence about the other one, they can put the other one away for the full time of the crime. If neither of them talk, then the police can hold them overnight, um, but then they have to let them go. Um, if both of them talk, then let's say the, the courts is going to say that this is a little strange, like the, 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 the evidence seems conflicting. So um, they might be able to hold them for a little bit longer than they would if they just like, held them um, overnight and um, they, like they might still have to go to trial, but then still it's likely that the, it's going to be thrown, the trial is going to be thrown out. It won't be a strong case. So overall, it's better for them both to not talk and cooperate with each other. Uh, but if you manage to defect and talk, rat out your other one, and the other one doesn't rat you out, then that's a lot better for you because you get out immediately and the other guy gets to spend the whole time in jail. So that's kind of the story behind the prisoner's dilemma. And there's a lot of sustainability problems which are this way as well. Two countries decide that they're going to go into an agreement on pollution control. And it says that they're only gonna pollute this amount. And if they cooperate, that means both countries don't pollute uh, more than that amount. But if they defect, then one might sneak over that one. And so then the question is, uh, at, you know, to what benefit do countries get by cooperating with these agreements. And that all has to do with how the net, how the externalities are structured. So um, in the case of the prisoner's dilemma, the way they're structured, we have the reward that, so what I'm going to do is the, um, the player one reward is going to be on the left and the player two reward is going to be on the right in each one of these boxes. So in the prisoner's dilemma, I can say that player one is going to get negative one and player two is going to get negative one um, if they both um, decide to cooperate. And I am just going to symbolically call this R, where R represents the reward for mutual cooperation. Now, if player one decides to cooperate, but player two decides to defect, then in that case, uh, player one is going to suffer the biggest penalty, negative five, they're gonna spend the, the, the full time in jail. But player two, who decided to defect, is going to be let out immediately. And so player one uh, gets what's called the sucker's penalty, S, and player two gets the so-called temptation to defect, T. And then it flips if player one is the one who defects and player two is the one who cooperates. And so in that case, we get zero comma five. So basically zero comma negative five, where we have temptation to defect and then sucker's penalty. And then if they both defect, then in that case, um, they, it's a little bit more of a hassle. Um, so if they're, they both defect, then they not only have to stay there um, for the time that, of this interrogation, but they also have to hang around uh, to go to court. And then in the, maybe the court ends up throwing the case out, but still it's more of a penalty on them. So that is the penalty for mutual defection. So I will refer to that as P. And so in order for this to be a prisoner's dilemma, then it must be the case that the temptation to defect is greater than the reward for cooperation and that has to be greater than the punishment for mutual defection, which has to be greater than the sucker's penalty. And in that case, this is the so-called prisoner's dilemma. 
And it is a collective action problem because it is, again, better off for them both to cooperate and do this, but because there is this temptation to defect. So it's better off for, um, for, for me to decide to, for you and I both to agree that I'm taking the highway and you're taking the side streets, but it's better off for, um, for you to take the highway on the off chance that we both all take the highway at the same time. And, but we may end up both being on the highway at the same time and then slowing down the highway. And so that's um, kind of an example here where this is maybe the ideal case, but let's face it, we're probably gonna land down here. And well, so, go ahead. Question, what does the S stand for again? We got like uh, temptation, reward, punishment. What's the S again? S okay. is the sucker's penalty. Suckers so guess, got it. Yeah, so um, I can do S is here the suckers uh, penalty. And that's just the conventional language for the prisoner's dilemma. How You're often, a sucker. And also another question, how often would it happen to get the calorie Higgs efficient, which is like negative one and negative one for both rewards? That's an excellent point. So that's the, the question here is that, that um, yeah, so I'm glad you, you brought that up is that this here, I, you know, this co-op co-op, that is our Calder Hicks. So it's Calder Hicks efficient uh, for co-op co-op. But it turns out that that is pretty much never gonna happen when the reward structure is set up this way. When the reward structure is set up here, um, when we do analysis of games, if we want to analyze what's an individual going to do, we use a, a, a framework known as Nash equilibrium. And so the Nash equilibrium equilibrium, this is um, a, a solution or um, it is a set of strategies that I'm going to say is selfishly optimal. That's one way to view it. I'd say selfishly optimal in uncoordinated case. So when you can't coordinate with anyone else, or to put another way, this is um, the, there is no way to improve uh, the uh, outcome or the reward by making a unilateral change. Unilateral change. And so what that means is what point in this grid is such that if both uh, players played that strategy in this grid and you held one player constant, the other player if they tried to change their strategy, they'd be worse off. And then if you did the same game where you then um, held that player constant and asked the other one, if they change their strategy, would they be worse off? At what point would they be kind of best off given that, um, that, the, that mutually, what, at what point are both players simultaneously best off without making a unilateral change? And that happens um, down here in this box over here. And so this, is the Nash equilibrium for the um, for this game? Because if you're, uh, you know, one player and you're getting a negative two, it is true that you could improve by um, so okay. Negative two is the payoff going to player two. So player two's. Uh, uh, points are this way. So if player two played defect, if player two were to say cooperate, then it would be worse off for them. Player one is playing defect. If player one were to instead play cooperate, it would be worse off for them. So given that the other player is fixed, then this option here is the safest choice that they can both lock into there. So given that you're stuck with all of the other players' choices, then the Nash equilibrium is a spot where your choice, if you change it, you're going to be worse off. There can be multiple Nash equilibrium in a game, but for a prisoner's dilemma, there is only one and it is down here. 
And that's the reason why when the payoff structure of a sustainability problem fits this Nash equilibrium, where it has this TRIPS structure, T greater than R greater than P greater than S, then it is mo most likely that all of the individuals will end up defecting because that ends up being better off for them, given that other individuals can defect. If you can get them to coordinate somehow and force them to coordinate, that changes the game. But given that they're uncoordinated, they're in different cells and they can't coordinate with each other, then this is what they're going to do, even though this is the Calder-Hicks. This is the socially efficient choice. So that's what we mean by Nash equilibrium. But it turns out that not all sustainability games are best represented by a prisoner's dilemma. And that's why in the next um, 12 minutes, I just want to show you two other games that are better match for some of these, um, for the open access and the public goods case. But are some other general questions about this? I try to introduce the prisoner's dilemma because I'm assuming that some of you have seen the prisoner's dilemma before, but, um, but maybe not in this level of detail. So are there questions about how things are broken up here? or about this Nash equilibrium versus the Calder-Hicks, which is over here. Okay. All right, so that's the prisoner's dilemma. But um, if we're interested in what motivated the beginning of this lecture, the um, open access goods problem, We'd say, what type of game is an open access goods problem? So I talked about the prisoner's dilemma in terms of the highway, which is the open access good, but it's a little artificial. I mean, I can kind of shoehorn it into a prisoner's dilemma, but it's not the most natural way to model the problem. So, um, and it turns out that there is a more natural way to model the problem. And so these open access goods problems are a type of so-called anti-coordination game. And anti-coordination games are one in which the, um, the, it's best for the players to do a different strategy. And by best, I mean it's going to be Nash optimal. So in the prisoner's dilemma, it's best for them. Um, and I just got a question on the anonymous question. So that's good. Thanks for that. Um, I'll come back to that in just a second. So in the, um, uh, in the prisoner's dilemma, it is best for the players to both defect. It's just unilateral. It's just best. That's the only thing they can do. In anti-coordination games, it's more interesting because it's best for them to do something different. But then the problem will be, who is doing what? That a that you know that symmetry breaking is going to be the major problem. So that's going to be the collective action problem. Is deciding um, who, so is coordinate is um, deciding how to break the symmetry. You know, in other words, who is doing which strategy? And there was a question um, uh, in the meeting pulse. Uh, what does a unilateral change mean in regards to a Nash equilibrium? So again, I just the, what I meant by unilateral change is if we're all playing a game um, and we all decide on what, what we're going to do, a unilateral change means that I am going to change my decision but you all are going to keep your decisions. So at the Nash equilibrium, it's a set of decisions that everyone is doing such that for every person, if you held everyone else the same at the Nash equilibrium, the person that you're focusing on, they don't, it won't be better for them to change. That's what I mean by unilateral. So if there's 10 of us playing a the game, then if we're at the Nash equilibrium, then if I go to each one and I say, okay, given that only you get to change your play, are you going to change it? You will be unwilling to change your play because given that everyone else is staying the same, it will be better off for you to hold your current position. 
So that's what we mean in the case of the prisoner's dilemma, is that given that the other, at the Nash equilibrium, given that the other guy is going to defect and there's no way to change that, then your best strategy is to also stay defecting. And likewise, given that uh, if we take the perspective of the other guy, we fix your strategy at defecting. And if your strategy is fixed at defecting, then it'll be best off for him to stay defecting. If um, What I'll show you in this game here, for these anti-coordination games, there are two Nash equilibrium, and that might make it clear what we mean by Nash. All right, so um, the particular anti-coordination game that I'm going to focus on here, there's a bunch of different types of anti-coordination games, but the most popular ones you hear about are the so-called hawk dove game, which is otherwise known as the game of chicken. And so, um, and this really fits well the highway example. So if I draw my, uh, my play at payoff matrix down here, again, I've got my player two choices, and I've got my player one choices, and I am just going to right next to that draw the highway example. Where um, I will say I've got my, I'll call this my driver one choices and my driver two choices. And so in the, in this case here, Then um, we've got if both, and so I'm, uh, I'm saying that the, the choices are say don't use the resource and use the resource. So I'll do don't use. So that's kind of like cooperate, and use is kind of like defect. And then over here, I can say this is side streets, and this is highway. So again, side streets in the top corner and highway in the bottom corner. And I know we've got five minutes left here, so we'll probably just do this one. And if you're interested in the public goods version of uh, which is the so-called stag hunt game, um, you can see the notes online. I also have a video about the public goods case that's online, um, but I mainly want to make sure that we get the least hawk dove in and then I'll not worry about um, testing you over the stag hunt this semester. But if you're interested, the stag hunt game is a very popular game that is sort of the answer to the Nash. Um, it's, it's much more realistic in the case of, a, um, say, emissions controls, because the positive externality is so high that cooperation actually does get some buy-in, unlike in the prisoner's dilemma where nobody ever cooperates. If you make the reward for cooperation high enough, you turn a prisoner's dilemma into a so-called stag hunt game, in which case you'll get some who cooperate and some who defect, a la public radio, a la pollution abatement, et cetera. So that's why most sustainability people are more interested in stag hunt games than prisoner's dilemmas. But for whatever reason, we teach prisoner's dilemmas first, just some accident of, you know, probably some idiot political scientist thought the prisoner's dilemma um, like uh, was was sort of more interesting. And so that kind of became the popular game theory case and now we're stuck with it. But in reality, stag hunt is probably a better model for what goes on in public goods. But all that's online. Let me get through this one here because I think this will be still be a useful example. So in the um, in the case of these hawk dove games, so this is a hawk dove or otherwise known as chicken. And you say, what do I mean by hawk dove? Well, then the, um, the use is going to be equivalent to a hawk strategy and the don't use will be considered to be a dove strategy. Uh, the hawk strategy also, if you think about the game of chicken, two cars coming at each other, the use is going to be uh, don't swerve and the don't use will be like swerve. So if you both swerve, you both tie and you both um, uh, tie in a way that's at least you don't nobody got hurt. So if you both uh, the don't use in the case of a tie, so I'm going to say that both of them get the reward T. And so in the case of the highways, both get home at normal time. 
in the case of um, player two uses and player one doesn't use, player one loses and player two wins. So we say that player two or driver two beats player one home and, um, and, and also, you know, faster than usual. In the symmetric case, you get player one wins and player two loses. So this is player one beats player two home. And then if they both use the highway, then it's, a, it's like a really bad tie where um, both get home late. And so in this particular case, you can work it out. And so, oh, and it'll be the case that W is greater than T is greater than L is greater than X. That defines a hawk dove or a chicken game, a game of chicken. And so in this case, the Nash equilibrium are the two ones where they um, are opposite. So we have a Nash equilibrium up here and a Nash down here. So a Nash down here and a Nash here. And so both of these are the Nash equilibrium. So this is a Nash and this is another Nash. And so you can do the math to see that if you both, if we manage to get them to agree that player two was going to use the highway and player one was not, then if you if they both agree to that, then neither one can change their decision unilaterally without the other one changing um, and get a better result. So if I've agreed to use the highway and you've agreed to use the side streets, it does not benefit me to change the side streets. If likewise you do you decided to use the side streets and I've decided to use the highway, if I'm going to stick to the highway, it is not beneficial for you to go onto the highway. So that's why this is a Nash equilibrium, but so is this. So the problem in Hawk Dove games is that we have two Nash. And so what tends to happen is either you need a mechanism which ends up breaking this symmetry. So you have this symmetry problem. So we have a symmetry problem. So either we need something like a traffic light or a third party to coordinate these things and, um, and then break this symmetry. Um, or what you're going to have is a mixture of the two strategies in society, where you're going to get a fraction of people taking the highway and a fraction of people taking the side streets. And that mixture, the amount of that mixture is going to depend on the relative amount of these rewards. And you can actually solve for what that mixture will be based on how these rewards um, uh, relate to each other. So that's one of the ways we end up doing that. All right, but I don't want to keep you any longer than that. We're at 115. I just wanted to give you at least an introduction to game theory as an alternative way to think about sustainability problems when the real question is a discrete question of, um, of doing one thing or another. And in a large society case, how many people do the one thing and how many other people do the other thing, voting or not voting, for example. Um, you know, th there's a lot of these different choices like that. But um, I'll stop there and, um, and we'll do an, a little attendance question for today. And that attendance question will be, um, what is an example Nash equilibrium for the Hawk Dove game? So what are the, in other words, um, what is a strategy mixture for the Hawk Dove game that is Nash optimal? And I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes if there's any questions. Again, I've got more content here on the kind of game theory that I just put in in case we had time. Um, but the big thing is I want you to kind of know the game theory exists. I want you to know the prisoner's dilemma exists. And I want you to be familiar with the open access problems as being referred to as Hawk Dove games. If you're interested in more, I definitely think check out that, um, that stag um, hunt.
Uh, just okay. making sure. Uh, for the Hawk Dove game, um, the TT both stands for like where they both swerve at the same time, meaning they both win. Um, TT, yeah. Well, they both don't don't um, win, but they both don't massively lose. Um, okay. So. Um, well, the other two, they're both natural believers. One either wins and one loses, and another one, the other wins, yet the other loses for both um, of those. R yeah, sorry. That, say that, so, yeah, say that one more time. I, I guess I was looking at the chat here. So, so you know, which two are you asking about again? I was talking about the the both natural equilibrium. Like, like one loses, one wins, or out of the or the other one, like the um, they both switch places. Right, right. So, so basically, yeah, you've got a Nash um, where you can actually be the loser at the Nash, but because there's a worse choice, so. Um, it's true that tying is better than losing, but if you're stuck with a unilateral decision, then um, then if the other person is already doing the winning strategy, then if you change your decision, then you're going to get stuck doing um, getting the, the major, you're going to end up tying with the other person, and that tie is going to be a bad tie as opposed okay. to a good tie. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yep. And if there are people having, um, if you had trouble with the link, maybe I put the wrong link. No, I think I've got the right link in the in the chat and I clicked on it, it works for me. And other people are saying it's working for them. So if you're getting um, errors, then of course the attendance question, I, I, I don't accumulate tabulate attendance for 24 hours. So um, feel free to give it a shot later and you should be able to get into the link. I don't know why it wouldn't be working unless it's a temporary like server issue. It's coming up for me and it looks like it's coming up for others. Um, I did have a question. It's not about the lecture though, it's about the homework. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that I was doing the like the the regenerating of the plots correctly. Um, when we're doing that, we're recreating the graph that was already made and just putting in our new utility, like different utilitarians and Cobb Douglas. Um, but we're just like kind of doing the indifference curves. We're not necessarily graphing two different points, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think I gave you four strategies. So I'm basically expecting you to redraw my plot. And then on top of that plot, you can overlay like different indifference curves, like, you know, little lines or curves. Perfect. And then you can write next to the points, the utilities. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's what I was doing. I just wasn't sure if I was like missing something or it seemed almost too easy. I was like, wait, um, but I think that's it. Thank you so much. Sure. Any other questions? Looks like We've got kind of an anti-quorum here. All right, in that case, I will uh, see everybody next week. Have a good weekend. Also have office hours today at four. <laughs>